Throughout the history of mankind, people have sought to receive as many benefits as possible from nature, treating its wealth as a bottomless pantry. People consume to without giving anything in return. A lot of time has passed before people learned to restore forests, wild fauna, grow different types of plants and animals in their yards. Today we'll talk about people who have adopted the laws of nature in order to benefit society. Malen Tursin Ali is a professional ichthyologist. He was born in Narinkol, a small village in the southeast of Kazakhstan. There are no lakes around, only small mountain rivers. No one has ever heard of fish farming here. A couple of years ago, our enthusiast built his own farm, where he grows sturgeons and trout. In Kazakhstan, unlike in other countries, people seldom eat fish. For most households, fish is an expensive product although fish meat provides huge health benefits. It is necessary to include it in the diet of Kazakhstanis, says Malin. Historically, the diet of Kazakh people mainly consisted of lamb and horse meat. But we need to eat more fish. Scientists say that a fish diet reduces the risk of heart diseases and diabetes. Fish meat contains omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins that help prevent many diseases. In Kazakhstan, you can grow fish in natural and man-made reservoirs. To do this, you need help from specialists like us. I would be very happy if fish were grown in clean waters of Kazakhstan's lakes. It took Malin a while to find himself in this business. In 2010, he received a degree in ichthyology. He worked as a laboratory assistant at the Kazakh Research Institute of Fisheries, and a few years later he moved to the private sector as a fish farmer. Soon he became convinced that fish farming was in demand, but this job required deeper knowledge. Marlen gained valuable experience during an internship in Europe. I know that you studied in Spain. What do you have to say about this experience? It was an invaluable experience. We learned how to breed the trout, how to disinfect and how to use medications. We don't have necessary drugs nor antibiotics for the fish here in Kazakhstan. That's why we conduct joint programs to improve the immunity of young fry. We found proper immune boosters that we are planning to use here. If all goes well, we'll begin incorporating them next year. It should increase survival rate of the fish and reduce losses. Marlen to Sinali's fish farm is located near Almaty in the village of Tashkent Sas. The farm grows 50 tons of trout and 10 tons of sturgeon annually. Only 10 people work here. Marlen believes that this is more than enough to handle the farm. There are several reservoirs in the area with a strange-looking inhabitant, Siberian sturgeon. I see sturgeon noses peeking out of the water. Why are they doing this? I have never seen such behavior in nature. Sturgeons rise up like this to get some air. Sturgeon is considered a royal fish. How does it behave in a pond like this? What do they feed on? How would you describe their behavior? We use special feed for sturgeons, just as you said, they are bottom feeders. Trout feed on slowly floating food, and for sturgeons we use special sinking feed. It goes down to the bottom, where they eat it. There are more than 60 species in the sturgeon family, seven of which are found in Kazakhstan. Beluga or great white sturgeon, sterlet, Russian sturgeon, Siberian sturgeon, starry sturgeon, bastard sturgeon and sirdaria sturgeon. Sturgeon is a delicacy, therefore it has always been caught in large quantities. 
By the end of the 20th century, sturgeon population in the Caspian Sea and the river Ural dropped catastrophically. The time has come to regulate the fishery. One must attain a special permit to fish for sturgeon in the wild. Some species are red listed in Kazakhstan and fishing for them is strictly forbidden. However, Siberian sturgeon is unpretentious fish and can be grown on such mini fish farms. Is it possible to restore sturgeon population in the river Ural and the Caspian Sea? Of course it's possible, although more research is required. The problem nowadays is that we try to repopulate it with a small fry, weighing from 5 to 15 grams. Those have very low survival rates, at least 100 grams. The bigger it is, the stronger is its immunity, therefore better chances to survive. What if you release fully grown specimen into the wild? How many eggs are normally laid by a single fish? And how many of those will survive? For instance, sturgeon weighing 10 kilograms will release 1 kilogram of eggs, 10% of its body weight. A kilogram of spawn contains around 60,000 eggs. If 30-50% of those survive, it will be a great result. In the farm, fish is separated by its weight. There is a pool for large fish from 5 to 7 kilograms. The other one is for fish weighing 1 kilogram. This one over here contains fish weighing 1.5 to 2 kilograms. This is done to make feeding the fish more convenient. Each weight category of fish requires its own type of food. During the first year of life, students are being relocated at least 10 times. Therefore, we must be careful when catching it, and be sure to lift it by the nose and never by the tail. Now I'll try to get the fish. I'm holding it under the tail because the fish is slippery, but I'll try to hold it steady. Look at those perfect forms. This is sturgeon. Pay attention to its mouth. It is located on the underside of its head because it feeds off the bottom. Let's not trouble the fish any longer. We'll release it back to the water. This fishery follows European model when you grow a lot of fish on a relatively small territory. In addition, Malen noted that European specialists are gradually replacing expensive circulatory water systems to more natural ones like the pond systems. Malen's fish is also from Europe. Fertilized eggs are delivered directly from Denmark. How big can fish like this grow in natural conditions? It takes a lot of time for beluga to mature. It can grow up to 1 or even 10 tons. In farm conditions, Siberian sturgeon can grow up to 60 kilograms. Their breeding age is around 6 to 11 years. That is when you can harvest caviar. Growing sturgeons in artificial environment is a challenging task. Wonderfully so, this fish farmer is passionate about his profession and despite his youth already knows many secrets of this craft. We can't grow Russian sturgeon in those pools. This reservoir's water temperature is around 14 to 17 degrees Celsius, which is suitable only for the Siberian sturgeon. Russian sturgeon requires water temperature of around 20 to 22 degrees. During trout incubation period, we keep this pool's water temperature at around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. After the incubation, we relocate all the fish to that pool with 14 to 15 degrees, so it can grow to a marketable size. Crystal clear artesian water is brought to these pools with temperature maintained at 17 degrees. The water is also aerated, the process which enriches water with oxygen. And feeding, of course. Just like that, food, temperature, water and aeration – the main components of normal fish growth. This duck room is an incubator for trout larvae. 
Each pool contains larvae weighing from 1 to 7 grams. It takes a month and a half to grow 3 to 4 centimeters long fry. And single larvae requires 4 months to complete full incubation cycle. When the fry grows into marketable fish, they are prepared for shipping to city stores. But before shipping, the fish is kept in clean water with no food for 10 days. This procedure helps remove unpleasant odor and maintain high quality of meat. During this period, fish lose a little weight, but the meat remains tasty. Do you think Chinese consumers would buy fish like this or it is not to their liking? We have signed supply contracts with China, therefore on behalf of our fishery I can say that it is possible to sell our fish abroad. We were planning expansion this year, but due to circumstances we couldn't make it in time. Next year we are going to grow 220 tons of trout. A young farmer is obsessed with his profession. His working day begins at 6 in the morning and ends late at night. He is dreaming of opening his own fish farming school at his fishery, plans to train students for three years. Marlin says that because of Chinese market, the industry has a potential. My mission is to disseminate my experience, share knowledge by launching the school, provide people with necessary materials, with fish food and explain how the product is made. I think that fish grown in ponds is the best because of the clean mountain water. This product will always be in demand. Malin says that Kazakhstan has great potential in fish farming. The state begins to support startup entrepreneurs by providing subsidies. Thus, the principle of not giving men a fish but teaching him how to fish is implemented. Malin and his followers have a noble task to feed their people with healthy and wholesome food. A fish diet wouldn't hurt anyone. We cooked a trout soup uha on a bonfire. Absolutely delicious. Here it is, a wonderful trout to her. Pink meat, almost no bones. Let's try it out. So good. Beekeepers set their apiaries high in the mountains of Transali Latal, where you can hear rushing waters of the river Turgen, and herbs aroma persists throughout the summer. The sight of even rows of bee houses touches hearts of passing tourists. Let's visit one of the apiaries. I'm at the apiary. Have a look at those two types of hives. This is a wooden handmade hive, probably was made in a workshop or a small factory. And that one is a modern portable hive made of plastic with convenient side handles. And most importantly, it is insulated to keep the bees warm. You shouldn't knock on the hive. Bees are very sensitive to vibrations and can get quite protective. We better step aside. In the apiary, we are greeted by the family of beekeepers, Guberevs. Father and son have been in the honey trade for several years now. They will tell us about the honey gathering and all the nuances of this trade. So the main tools of beekeeper are a bee smoker and a special chisel. What is the smoker filled with? What do you use it for? A bee smoker is needed to distract the bees, because in nature, when bees sense smoke, they stash some nutrients inside their bodies and flee from the hive. 
корм определенное количество и готовое улететь, слететь. Can bees sense fire? They can sense fire or any other threat intuitively. And with a little bit of smoke, we make them busy preparing for the takeoff. Therefore, we get less attention. And what's inside the bee smoker? Coal or maybe grass? We use small chunks of rotten wood. Apple or cherry trees both are good options. Try to avoid using conifer wood, though. It's autumn in the mountains. Bees are no longer flying. They're preparing for winter in their carefully sealed wax houses. But we were promised that we'll see one bee family. The beekeeper is trying to open one of the hives with a chisel while keeping bee smoker nearby. After all, bees can be aggressive when protecting their home. This chisel is a brilliant tool. You can chop wooden chunks for the bee smoker, open hive frames, use it as a screwdriver and work with it here on the apiary that consists of 80 hives. Thus, two people are enough to handle this massive job. With a little bit of effort, we took out the frame with bee honeycombs. They are in perfect shape, but there is little honey in it. It is the outermost frame. This honey supply should be enough to feed the entire bee family until this spring. One bee family usually consists of 50,000 insects. How do bees feed during winters? During winter, hungry bees gather around the honeycomb and by raising their body temperature, they melt the wax seal of the honeycomb. The bee family is one of the most curious creations of nature. They have rules and regulations. Each insect knows its responsibilities and does its job accordingly. This is a community with a strict hierarchy, at the head of which is the queen bee. This marked bee is a queen. This one is a queen bee? I can't believe that we got a chance to see it. Not much bigger than an ordinary bee. Not too much, she's twice as big. You've managed to spot a queen bee with a single glance. How many of these queens are in the hive? One per family. Here she is with a red mark. Did you tag her or it's a natural mark? No, the beekeeper marks the queen. The queen of the hive is the only bee that can lay fertilized eggs. Usually it lays around 1,200 eggs per day and almost twice as much during the summer. Egg-laying process begins at the end of winter and continues until the autumn frosts. The first two years are considered the most prolific for the mistress of the hive. The egg-laying intensity is diminishing over time. Caring worker bees surround the queen, look after her and accompany her everywhere. It's time to close the hive, so we don't harm the bees. Nobody will see this bee family until the next spring. Beekeepers closely monitor their health and select bee queen material. In Kazakhstan, they work with three types of bees. Carpathian honeybee, Carniolan honeybee and European dog bee. You mentioned that the queen bee is thoroughbred. Can it really be compared with a thoroughbred horse, cow or turkey? Thoroughbred queen lay around 20 to 2500 eggs per day, while common queen bee can lay only 12 to 1500 eggs. How long does it take for larvae to grow into a working bee? It takes about 21 days. But even after that period of time, the bee won't be gathering honey right away. It has other responsibilities. 
What kind of responsibilities can a bee have? They clean, guard and keep the hive intact. They dispose of bodies of the dead bees and litter, in other words, keep the hive clean. They also protect their families against the attack of other insects. Single bee has a period of 20 days to gather honey. But before the bee can fly for a search, it must remember hive location and all landmarks around it. Only then it is ready to fly out for honey. Which weather is the most favorable for bees? How many kilometers can they fly in search of honey and which pollen do they love the most? Bees are most productive in warm weather. Most importantly, during warm nights, the temperature must not be less than 16 degrees Celsius. Only during that time, flowers produce nectar for bees together. Productive honey collection range is within 3 kilometers. The hive weighs about 25 kilograms. Every day you see that it gets heavier. If the hive becomes heavier by 500 grams, this will be the yield of one day's work. Well, almost, but not exactly. We must take into account that there are offspring which also add weight. Imagine empty frames with some initial weight. The queen lays an egg there. After that, the egg begins to develop. Bees bring food for the larvae that came out of the egg, thus changing the overall weight. So that's not always true that if the weight of the hive increased by 500 grams, then it must be 500 grams of pure honey. With nectar comes the honey, which bees feed to the brood. Was it a productive year for bees? It was indeed. At least for us it was. What was the daily maximum this peculiar bee family was giving? two kilograms a day. In the mountains of Transalia Latal, the first polyniferous plants appear in April. That is when the work for bees begins. They carry pollen and nectar to the hive. A family develops, the brood is growing. But in the high mountains, where the finest, most environmentally friendly honey is retrieved, the honey flow period is very short and lasts for only 15 days a year. As an experienced beekeeper, could you tell me which plants in Kazakhstan do you consider to be the best honey plants? In my opinion, it's vipers, buglosses, sweet clover and phacelia. All plants give honey, almost all flowers. Some give pollen, some have nectar. These, I believe, are the strongest. The rest, sunflower and buckwheat, give a lot of nectar. Linden, all flowering plants, apples, cherry, plum, pear, all have some nectar, but in limited amount. Some give more pollen, others give more nectar, honey. Over 300 honey plants grow in Kazakhstan. One of the best crops for beekeeping is sweet clover. It gives up to 8 kilograms of nectar per hectare. Sweet clover has other excellent qualities. It is a good organic fertilizer, it absorbs nitrogen from the air and is an excellent feed for livestock. Mountain forbs give 200 to 300 kilograms of nectar per hectare. Herbs in the mountains are medicinal, so mountain honey is fragrant, flavorsome and wholesome. In summer, in alpine meadows, bees literally swirl, rejoicing in the abundance of flower nectar. Today it's quiet in the mountains, but you can find delicious surprises like this. Bees, these little creatures, play a huge role in the ecosystem of the planet. Most of the Earth's plants are pollinated by these insects. Scientists are concerned and warning people that if bees disappear, humanity will perish as well. Therefore, many people are already thinking about ways to save bees and beekeeping and, by and large, save civilization. One of those who care is Sergei Tereshenko, the former Prime Minister of Kazakhstan, today the leader of Kazakhstan's 
beekeepers. Can honey become a brand of Kazakhstan? Honey has already become a brand of Kazakhstan. International community already knows about us. Every year, the International Federation of Beekeepers Associations, also known as Epimondia, holds its meeting. We take our products there every year. That's how they know Kazakhstan. Our mountain honeys, Lepsi, Turgen, Isik and Kaskilen honey. In general, all gorges from China to Tashkent provide with mountain honey of the highest quality. Honey of East Kazakhstan is wonderful too. Steppe honey is great as well. Sergei Tereshenko began associating with beekeeping in 2009, and a year after he organized the National Union of Beekeepers. He has long-term goals to create the beekeeping industry in Kazakhstan and to cultivate a culture of honey consumption among people. To make sure that people consume honey, we need to talk about it, we need to introduce these topics in schools. According to statistics, Kazakhstanis consume 500 tons of sugar per year. Disregarding the fact that everyone knows how harmful sugar is, and only 50 grams of honey is consumed per year. Our union is aiming to popularize honey. We organize the production process and are planning to make a lot of it. The head beekeeper of the country is certain the future of Kazakhstan lies on bees. The Republic has vast territories with wide variety of reliefs to facilitate any type of apiaries. There are lands where you can plant industrial crops, there are also diverse wild honey plants. But despite that, Kazakhstan produces little honey, only 50,000 tons per year. The country needs specialists, tens, hundreds of thousands of beekeepers. Then the high bar set by Sergei Tereshenko will not seem ridiculously excessive to anyone. He believes that in the future, Kazakhstan can produce a million tons of honey per year. I saw huge prospects. Many people laugh at me. They say that I am a dreamer. One million tons of honey produced in Kazakhstan in the next 15-20 years, this will happen. Bees are not only for honey, but also for a variety of other healthy and tasty foods. The most interesting and delicious part of visiting the apiary will get to taste the honey. We won't taste just honey, we'll try honeycombs. Let us explain to the audience what it is and how to eat it. Honey is made in a honeycomb. Bees bring honey and then seal these cells with caps like this. These caps contain the substance lysozyme, which prevents the development of bacteria and fungi. This enzyme is considered preservative. Is this a valuable medicinal substance? Valuable indeed, for humans too. It doesn't provoke addiction and can be consumed regularly without any effects. It is called resistance. It will work its charm every time. If while eating honeycomb some wax gets into your mouth and you swallow it, there's nothing to worry about. Let's try it out. Scrumptious. Is it alpine honey? No, from our mountains. Our apiary stands in the area of mountain Forbes. For centuries, in all cultures, people have used the experience of bees, its healing, miraculous properties. Bees' organization and hard work made them a role model for people to follow. So our visit comes to an end. This apiary can be called exemplary. There are about 70 hives. There are great prospects for beekeepers in Kazakhstan. There is an opportunity not only to revive beekeeping and return to the previous level, but even surpass it. We understand that honey is an organic, natural product. Any chemical products can be made in abundance, and sooner or later there will be a shortage of honey. I think that this time will come soon. Therefore, 
beekeepers of Kazakhstan must be prepared. We left the apiary, recharged and rested. New journeys and exciting stories about the secrets of nature are ahead of us.